Welcome to the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast, where you will learn how to identify, evaluate, negotiate, perform due diligence on, finance, turn around and operate mobile home parks. And now, here is your host, the fifth largest mobile home park owner in the United States, Frank Rolf. Sewage, is there anything dirtier than that? What about trying to dig down through a big pile of muck and mud and water, trying to get to a water leak? In this, in our series on dirty jobs that mobile home park owners have to deal with, we're going to be examining just that, water and sewer. It's such a huge and crucial issue when you own a mobile home park, and it's also just a really dirty job. But if you are not successful at dealing with water and sewer, It'll make a dirty job of your budget as well. This is Frank Croft, the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast, and we're going to be going over everything we know about water and sewer in mobile home parks. Let's start off with water. There's two types of water lines in a mobile home park. There can be galvanized metal and there can be PVC. Now, most of the time, most of the parks you look at are going to be galvanized metal simply because The golden age of park construction started in the 50s and ran through the 70s, and there really wasn't any PVC at that time. That doesn't mean there weren't some newer parks built since then, and also maybe your park was retrofitted to PVC at some point in the past. But normally you're dealing with galvanized metal piping. That's not all bad. It does corrode. It does get little pinhole leaks or sometimes snaps off entirely. But it doesn't really hurt anything. All you do when that happens is you fix it. And all you're at is the cost of the leak, but your grass and your trees are actually happier and all the happier for it. Now, there's two types of water systems. There's well water and there's city water. We always prefer, as everyone does, municipal water. It means it's treated by the city. I don't have to worry about it at all. Well, a little different. I'm in charge of my own water supply. I have to dig down. I've got to go ahead and rework the well occasionally. I have to chlorinate it and put it in a holding tank. I also have to test it. So, obviously, city water is a whole lot easier than well water. And PVC is a whole lot easier than galvanized. But the reality of the water system in most parks are they're pretty much okay. We've only ever repiped two mobile home parks ever out of the hundreds we've owned. And even the other big owners like Sun Communities have never repiped a single one, someone in their real estate department told me. So, mostly you just patch your water lines along. So, even though it's a dirty job... It's not that big a deal keeping water systems in pretty good working order. Now, how often you get breaks and issues with water lines depends on where you are. Depends on how the lines are built. Basically, depends on even the earth itself. If you have a lot of shifting that goes on in your soil, like in Texas in the summer, where you get big cracks in the ground, then your lines are more prone to break. But other areas have very, very great, stable soil And the lines just don't break that frequently. It's not a very frequent repair call that we get that we have a broken water line. So that's not that big a deal. But now bigger deal as a park owner is where the heck is the water going and what is it costing me? Water is the single biggest line item on most parks' budgets. So as a result, if you lose control of that water bill, you're in a heap of trouble. So how do you do that? How do you stay on top of the dirty job of trying to keep your water bill reasonable? Well, here's what you do. There's two places water can be lost. One is in your main lines, and the other is in the homes themselves. When you're looking to buy in the park, there's a company called American Leak Detection. They're franchised across America. You can go ahead and have them come out and look at your water lines using a patented device like a stethoscope that listens for hissing noise in the earth. And that hissing noise means a leak. So they'll go through your park, and they'll be listening for leaks, and they'll mark them as they go. And they're very, very accurate. And they can even tell you how many gallons each leak is doing. Now, if American Leak Detection goes through your park and finds a lot of leaks, and that means you're wasting water there and you need to get the leaks fixed. But what if they go through and there's no water being wasted, yet your bills are too high? Then that means it's the customers. They're abusing water. They either have internal leaks in their homes or they just have lifestyles where they use a lot of water. I was in a park recently and I saw a guy with a giant commercial water truck right up against his home with a hose in it. You know what he's doing. He's refilling that every night before he goes to work. He could be a landscaper. He could work in concrete. I don't know what he's using the water for. But imagine if you were using your 
hose at home to fill up a pool every night, you can imagine how big your water bill could be. Hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month. That park owner probably does not realize what's going on. And if he's not so metered, he's probably paying the customer to live there. He's probably charging $300 a month in lot rent. The customer's using probably $600 a month in water. So how do you break tenant abuse? How do you identify tenant abuse? Well, here's what most people do. If your water bill is roughly about $40 a month for water and sewer combined, then that is typically a tenant who's in pretty good working order on the way they use water in their lifestyle. So in that case, there's not much going on. But as you approach $100 a month, you know bad things are happening. And the only way you can grasp control is to meter. If you meter your water, that way people pay for what they use. That always fosters conservation. Typically, water bills decline by 30% when you install those meters, and that's pretty impressive. But the only way you can truly get a handle on where water goes in most parks is to A, do American leak detection to make sure there's no leaks in your main lines, and B, install meters and build a residence for what they use. That's becoming standard practice in the industry. I would say that probably 90% of every park purchased today by a professional investor, they're immediately putting meters on and starting to build the water back, and it makes complete sense. The meter of choice, of course, is the Metron meter. It's a product that came out of Europe, now used in the U.S., and the amazing part is it reads your water readings every 20 minutes, and it allows you to see when there are actual leaks going on. So that's how owners get a hold of the water. You see, it's not really that dirty a job, but let's move to something far dirtier, and that's sewer. Now, sewer is very different than water. Why is that? Well, number one, sewer is not pressured. Sewer, you do not read with a meter. Sewer basically is just gravity fed down the line till it ultimately goes somewhere where it's treated. Now, the options for sewer treatment are as follows. There's city sewer. That way, the city takes care of your sewage for you. But then there's three other options which are private. One, septic. You all know what that is. Sure, that's easy. Sewage goes to a canister, and then it goes off into the ground where it's absorbed. Your business partner is basically Mother Nature, and she's a pretty good business partner regarding septic. Next one, packaging plant. Your sewage goes into a treatment plant, like a miniature city treatment plant. Typically a concrete rectangle, about 20 by 40 feet, sometimes bigger. It comes in raw sewage. One end comes out the other end, 98% pure. Typically runs off into a stream or creek as it comes out 98% pure. Third style, lagoon. This is not good. Sewage goes into a big pit, also known as a cesspool. The liquids evaporate. It's a really nasty, horrible mess. Most states are trying to get rid of cesspools or trying to get rid of lagoons. Denver has been very prolific at it. They have it down to about 10 of them left. But every state will one day jump on the bandwagon because raw sewage sitting there is terrible for health. It's just a terrible idea in general. It doesn't smell good. doesn't look good. It's all going to go the way of the buffalo over time. So parks that have lagoons, I would avoid. I wouldn't even buy them. That's too dirty a job to even contemplate in most cases. However, packaging plant, we own some of those. And septic, we certainly own some of that as well. So that's how those work. And do they really work? Yes. Yes, they do. Packaging plants always work fine. The only danger with packaging plant is the capital cost when they go out, because here's the terrible news. It can cost you about a million dollars in some cases to replace that packaging plant. And the inexpensive ones are still going to be probably about three or $400,000. That is well beyond the budget of most parks to make any economic sense. Septic's different. Septic is, again, a relationship with Mother Nature. You have your own business partnership. Most of those septic parks have been running for half a century. No reason they'll ever stop. So basically, septic is okay. But again, you have to be worried. It's not necessarily the capital cost. It just worries you because you might have to replace the leach field at some point or some of the tanks. Now, the leach field is typically $4,000 to replace, so that's not going to kill you. And the tank might be 1000 but it's simply the fact in life when you have potential for capital calls that scares people. So when you have septic or you have a packaging plant and hopefully not lagoon, just the fact that you are in the middle of that always makes things unpleasant. So that's how sewage works. Now let's talk about sewage pipes. Several options here. Clay tile, that's the original and a really good product. That was definitely what you've got if you bought a park in the 50s or the 60s. Then, sometime in the 60s to the 70s, they experimented with cast iron. 
Again, not a bad product, although unlike clay tile, it tends to bend over time. If you don't lay it properly, it will bend, and those bends create what's called bellies in the line. Since sewage only flows with gravity, what happens is you then have to worry about the sewage stopping and not making its daily commute out to the main area where it's treated. So you may have a little bit more rotor rootery going on with that. After that, they did some terrible products. Orangeburg, Orangeburg means you have to repipe the entire park. And then a thin-walled PVC, some call it Schedule 10 or Schedule 20. I don't know what you call it. You'll immediately spot it. It's not PVC. It's not what we know of as PVC. It's very, very brittle, typically turns yellow when it's buried, terrible product. And then after that, you have the PVC, which is the all-time greatest. Not sure you can even improve on it. It's so darn good. What's the main worry with the sewer lines? Well, if you've got clay tile, the biggest concern is root intrusion because clay tile pieces don't fit together that tightly. As a result, trees will try and get their roots in there to get a constant source of liquids. Not a bad plan on the part of the trees, but not good for you as the park owner. When that happens, the roots will get in and either stop the line by growing these giant root balls in your line that you have to remove with a rotor rooter, or in fact, they can't even cause your line to cave in. Now, on the cast iron, of course, in PVC, they fit together so tightly that can't happen. But nevertheless, even though clay tile is the number one feature of parks built in the 50s and the 60s and even the 70s, it's a great product. So it's very, very rare to replace sewage lines unless you have that Orangeburg feature. Even the thin-walled PVC, most of it has already caved in over time. So those have already mostly been replaced. The fear with Orangeburg is it dissolves over time. So really, normally your sewage is traveling through cavities of the earth they were only there because there was a pipe at one time and then it dissolved. So that's a pretty bad thing to have happen. Our number one sewage repair as a park owner is, of course, rotor rooter Our customers cook with lots of grease and their disposals rarely work. So they cause giant grease balls that will slam lines shut. But the good news is rotor rooter is very effective at removing those and not super expensive. Figure on maybe $250 in some markets to get that fixed. Another point I want to point out is you definitely always want to use a licensed plumber, always when regarding water and even sewer, I would say, in most cases, because water and sewer is something you don't want to mess around with. It's too dangerous. Water, people drink. Sewer, you can guess what happens if the sewer gets backs up. You've got a real health issue going on. So try to always use a licensed plumber. Don't just use somebody who lives in the park who's super cheap, because in that case, it's a little too serious to go for super cheap. One more item we didn't talk about called the lift station. It's a really, really dirty job if that goes bad. Bear in mind, sewage cannot run uphill. It can only run down. It only goes by gravity. So when your city's line is higher than the park's lines, you have to push it uphill. And what does that is a lift station. Concrete cylinder with two pumps in it. The sewage falls in and is pushed uphill. What's the dirty job there? Well, the dirty job is, number one, those motors can sometimes go out. Most of them have two motors, but if both go out, you're in a real problem. Interesting bit of trivia, what typically makes those motors go out is underwear. Believe it or not, people somehow flush underwear into the toilet, into the sewer line, and that will wrap around the motor. And that such a seemingly harmless item with elastic in it and cotton, it catches in the gears and will burn the gears out and blow the motor out. When you have a lift station that isn't functioning with its motors, here's what happens. It fills up with sewage until it comes out the top. Then you have raw sewage flying everywhere. That is a real crisis. You can also have both motors running and you can still lose your sewage being pumped out if you lose electricity. That's why many smart park owners have uh, generators around that are handy that they can go ahead and install and turn on in the event of a power outage so they don't have a problem. Another tip, if you start realizing that your, your lift station's not working, turn your water off quickly. That is the key item that can sometimes save the day for the park owner is if you stop additional water going into your sewage lines, then you'll stop the pressure that goes into the lift station. So those are the ins and outs of the dirty job of water and sewer in parks. Probably of everything I told you, the most important thing to watch over is your water bill itself. It is, in fact, the largest line item in most parks. So you've got to make sure you're on top of it. Now, you'll improve your odds enormously if you make that the tenant's problem. If you put through 
sub meters and start building them directly, then they have to worry about that large line item and no longer you. The most common dirty item we have with water sewer is rotor rooter. Rotor rooter is a number you should always keep handy, even when you're out to dinner, because if anything ever happens, it seems that's always what happens. And you always have those clogs on the most inconvenient days and times. Typically, it's on Christmas Day or Thanksgiving, because people do a lot of cooking, a lot of grease, a lot of injecting things into the sewer system that just don't work out. So again, this is Frank Roth with the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast Series. Hope you enjoyed this segment on dirty jobs, water, and sewer. And we'll be back next week with some more Dirty Jobs. Thank you for listening to the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast. Be sure to visit us at mhpmastery.com to subscribe to the show, read our show transcriptions, and access all of our great information on mobile home park investing.